In the world of Reverse 1999, the story takes a much more grounded and dark turn on real historical events. If we take a look at this game, most people would be confused or curious with its story and timeline. There is a lot to take note of here, especially with its retro-style design, the blended and unique outfits for each character, and its setting, wherein it references a lot of media and fictional tales from the 20th century. There are museum heists, forest witches, people who can turn into animals, and this talking door here. If you didn't yet know about this game, then you'll be surprised to know that this video is sponsored by Reverse 1999. This game is a 20th century time travel strategic RPG featuring an alternate Earth where arcanists, or natural born spellcasters, and regular humans coexist. Something catastrophic has happened on the last day of 1999, and the flow of time has come unraveled, flowing backwards a phenomenon known as the Storm. Vernon, known as the Timekeeper, appears to be the only arcanist immune to the Storm and sets out to find the truth about this phenomenon in the year 1999. With the game first launched globally back on October 26th, it is now set to version 1.2 titled A Nightmare at Green Lake, featuring a full cast of English voice actors and authentic accents for each character. A simple but strategic gameplay experience where you can build a team of four and cast spells each to your character's abilities, and stunning visuals mixing retro and modern aesthetics. It also highlights a handful of characters where it references items or figures from real history. An example would be the character Apple, which references the apple that first fell onto Isaac Newton's head, or the character a -Night, which references the sword Durandal from the times of Charlemagne, and the characters Sputnik and Voyager, taken from the space race era. There are a lot more characters such as these ones, and I simply adore these ideas for each character as it makes the players figure out what other references were chucked into this game. The game is now available on iOS, Google Play, and PC. You can also click the link in the description to download the game to gain up to 70 free summons and a guaranteed 6-star character in just your first 30 summons. As for its story, if you're keen to know more about it, I'll try to start with the summarized points of the main story for a much more understanding coming to version 1.2. The main story starts during the year 1966, when a pirate captain named Regulus was invited to register to a secret organization known as the Foundation. However, Regulus refused and escaped the scene, capturing two members along with her. Returning back to her ship, she and her companion named Mr. Apple ties them up and exposes them in her radio station. What is this, the Foundation, you ask? Well, firstly, the St. Pavlov Foundation runs as an international peacekeeping institution that is considered to provide the best charity to arcanists and its goal is to establish peace and order between humans and arcanists. It is run by their leader named Constantine, who we later meet further in the story. Now, what are arcanists? As I've mentioned earlier, the setting is an alternate world inspired by true history during the 20th century. In this world, science, magic, and alchemy all exist. Magic in this world is called Arcanum, and this divides the people of Earth into two different races, humans and arcanists, similar to the concept of humans and mutants, or muggles and wizards. Now, these arcanists are being recruited by two different organizations, the St. Pavlov Foundation and the Manus Vindictae. What is Manus Vindictae? It can be considered to be an extremist terrorist organization that fights for a new world order where pure-blooded arcanists are the rulers or leaders of it. They see regular humans as unfit to rule the world because they can be easily affected by their greed and hatred. To put it in simpler terms, they have a racist ideology towards humans, and the mixed arcanists where only one of the parents is an arcanist. They also believe that arcanists deserve a higher status while being treated as gods, and their plan is to make historic events happen sooner so that the storm arrives earlier. In doing so, they want the world to reverse to an era with the right order, where arcanists still had a high position in the world. The organization of Manus Vindictae has gained a lot of popularity, especially from arcanists who are tired of the discrimination they are subjected to by society and individual humans. Their behavior is also assumed to come from how pure arcanists' brains are shaped in a different way. While they don't consider half-blood arcanists to be part of their plan, they make an exception to those they consider special to join them. Their current leader is a woman named Arcana. Forget-Me-Not is also another prominent member, and her base is called the Sanctuary, which is immune to the effects of the storm. 
However, not all the followers of Manus Vindicte actually believes in their ideology or detests humans that much, but only wants to be kept safe from the storm and therefore is willing to join them. While the Foundation and Manus Vindicte can be presented as the sides of good and evil, Reverse 1999 doesn't put them in that way, because instead, these two organizations have their own hidden agendas and we can view their ways as having different shades of grey. Personally, I can say that the Foundation is the lesser of two evils, and it is where our main protagonist, Verdon, is aligned with. Jumping to another question, what is the storm? It is currently the main plot of the story, and its mystery is what drives our main protagonist in finding out the truth behind it. We can see throughout the story that it hasn't been revealed to the public, and it forces time to go backwards while erasing every time period it comes into contact with. The most common sign of the storm is that it begins as a normal huge rainpour, with thunder and lightning like a normal storm. After some time, the raindrops that fell rose up again from the ground and into the sky with everything else it touched getting taken away with it from people to buildings. The effects of the storm can vary depending on which time period it touches. In the 1960s, it turned people into cartoonish figures, referencing the rise of TV animation having a distinct style termed as cartoons, and in the 1990s, it turned the blood veins into cables, referencing the rise of electricity and cable networks in numerous cities. The first storm happened in 1999, and the phenomenon has currently been looming around the world for 8 years. Its effects on people can cause them to mutate and encounter numerous diseases all at once. One of the reasons Ferdin is so determined to find out the truth behind the storm is because it erased her mother and the memories of her during the first storm. Further into the story, researchers operating under the secret organization known as the Institutum Lorenz find out that the first storm was caused by the original butterfly based on the butterfly effect, which is a chain reaction based on small changes in the end becoming huge consequences. I'll be avoiding major spoilers, but this is just the basic understanding I've gathered about this phenomenon. Now, going back to Reverse's setting, there are also the critters, which are mysterious creatures that roam this world. In biblical beliefs, they are said to be the creatures that do not take Noah's Ark in this game's lore, and arcanists are the ones who can encounter these strange creatures the most. Critters can refer to many different types, as their forms vary from the location of their habitats. Now focusing on the characters, Verdun is the timekeeper, and was born and raised by the Foundation. However, with a mystery regarding her mother, she distances herself from the Saint Pavlov Foundation and tries to find her own way of sheltering arcanists from the storm. While the Foundation and Manus Vindicte have their own buildings which are immune to the effects of the storm, Verdun has her briefcase, an entirely new environment with enough space to house numerous arcanists and historical items such as paintings, vases, and newspapers from different time periods. This is the main screen of the game, and it somewhat explains why we can summon arcanists on our account. On to the characters aligned with the Foundation. There are a lot, actually. These are Regulus, Madame Z, Horopedia, and Zonetto. Zunetto is an arcanist and a high-ranking official in the ranks of the Foundation. She accompanies Verdin throughout the story and is somewhat Verdin's assistant. She plays a relevant role to the story, especially with the latest event, which is why I wanted to introduce her before we start jumping on to the next. Now, jumping to the events of the latest version, it starts when a group of teenagers arrive at a campsite near Green Lake. These are Michael the Fool, Jason the Nerd, Freddy the Jock, and the Virgin, and Jennifer the typical Bonnie, also known as Blooney. You can see that this setup references some slasher films in the past while adding some horror elements. As soon as they arrive at the campsite, Blooney and Freddy seclude themselves while the rest gather materials for the campsite. As Blooney and Freddy continue their tussle, it suddenly halts when an unknown figure with a hideous mask comes out from the bush and strikes Freddy with a cleaver. Freddy bleeds to his death, and Blooney screams for help, but no one is coming anytime soon. The rest of the gang hears the commotion, and Anne and Jason hurry to help, but realizes that it is too late to save their friends. With the killer on the streak, he goes after Jason and kills him. Now, with Michael and Anne as the only survivors, they try to escape from the killer and run away as fast as possible, but are soon met with another unexpected surprise. Inside the St. Pavlov Foundation, a mysterious horror story is being circulated across the members of the Foundation, mainly because of Horopedia. 
Horopedia is an arcanist working for the Foundation, and points out that during the 1970s, a group of children were sent to an expedition working for the Xeno Armaments Engineering and Technology Academy. In this expedition, these children were situated at a campsite near Green Lake. It was going well until all contact from the youth force suddenly vanished. To investigate, they found out that the cabin these children were placed in became deserted, leaving only traces of open books, clothes, and blankets. Three months later, the same youth force who were thought to have gone missing suddenly came back to the Xeno main base and smelled of fungi with changed personalities and appearances. The youth force claimed that they just came back from a mission in the rainforest. As days went by, the youth force displayed signs of aggression and soon became insane. Ending the story, Vernon claims that most of the details could have been exaggerated, but there could be some truths behind it. Another arcanist overhears the conversation and shares her own insights about the story. Her name, Miss Campbell, under the alias of Tooth Fairy, introduces herself and decides to also join them on their trip to Green Lake. To share the backstory of Miss Campbell, let us take a moment back to when she was just a little 8-year-old girl. She is part of a full-blooded family of arcanists, the Campbells, and when she was in her youth, she swallowed a glowing pixie creature that was crawling under her bed. She was dealing with many toothaches at that time and could not bear with the pain. However, after she was done consuming this glowing creature, the toothache suddenly felt numb to her and it gave her a brief moment of a painless and calm feeling. She continued to eat eight more little critters, but these mysterious creatures soon retaliated and stole 11 of her baby teeth. In order to find a solution, her parents gave her a special type of brace for her teeth to prevent all of it from getting stolen by the glowing fairies. But when these creatures could not steal a second time from their host, they rushed their way to Miss Campbell's brother and stole all of his teeth instead. As time passed, the situation staggered and both siblings forgave the things that happened to them in their youth. This was when Miss Campbell decided to become a dentist and hoped to help numerous other children in easing their toothaches using the same flying creatures she consumed in the past. Now, Miss Campbell runs under the nickname of Tooth Fairy, giving references to the little creatures that inspired her to where she is now. Going back to the story, the group arrives at Green Lake and finds the campsite abandoned. However, they noticed a large crater behind them which was unusually large. Due to the critter, the group tries to escape and runs away from the scene. Then, as the surprise comes, the group encounters Jason and Michael being cornered by the Butcher Killer. Michael dies after getting decapitated, and as Anne is next, the group of Verdon, Sonato, and the Tooth Fairy tries to stop the killer. To our surprise, all the killers, who we thought to be dead, began to rise up and started explaining what just happened. It appears that Blooney and her crew were shooting for a horror movie where she was the director and writer. As things start to get confusing for Verdon and Sonata, Blooney explains that it was all an act for a film. With the details all cleared, rain suddenly starts pouring and forces all the group to head for the abandoned cabin, previously mentioned as the place where the Xeno Youth Force was stationed. Inside the cabin, we are further introduced to the rest of the crew. Blooney explains that Michael, Jason, and Freddy are her classmates while Anne is just someone from this part of the area who they signed up for their crew. All was going well until they realized that someone was unable to join them in shooting the film. It was Rod, who was supposed to play the role of the Butcher. Freddy the Jock soon explains to Blooney that Rod was unable to come due to health reasons, and the person who played the Butcher wasn't part of the original crew. Terrified of this realization, Blooney and her crew start freaking out. To make matters worse, the lights in the cabin suddenly went out, escalating to a more tense situation. At this point, I won't go any further as I encourage you to play the rest of the story and learn the truth by yourselves. It is written quite well and will get you more excited as the story continues further. Now, if you want to avoid spoilers, then I suggest that the duration of the video ends here. But if you want to learn more about Anne, the mysterious girl who Blooney just signed up for her crew, then I should warn you. To start, Anne isn't actually just a hometown girl that Blooney found near Green Lake. She is actually an arcanist, with the ability to change her appearance into various forms. In simple terms, she is a shapeshifter and she was part of an experiment conducted by Zeno and left her in the woods alone after an increased critter activity near Green Lake. Luckily, she meets a girl living in the area named Jennifer, also known as Blooney. Jennifer was fond of horror movies and shared these with her. 
However, Jennifer's parents decided to move out from the countryside into the city, severing the ties between her and Jennifer. As Jennifer left, she took the name of Jessica, taking after the main character in Jennifer's horror stories. As years passed, Jessica lived alone at Green Lake, with only the little critters as her friends. She was soon surprised when Jennifer came back to Green Lake and organized a horror film in her return. This explains the whole premise of the latest event, and we further see what other powers Jessica can do as an arcanist. She can manipulate her surroundings, change into different forms, and control the little critters around her. At this point, I personally could say that Jessica is one of the most powerful arcanists in the game's lore, and which explains why the Foundation is set on educating and mentoring her to better control her gifted powers. Now this marks the end of the video, and I really encourage you guys to check out this game for yourselves. There are a lot more details I haven't covered in this video, but I want you to experience it for yourselves. The story is very interesting and has a unique approach in mixing real-life events with fictional ones. As I've said earlier, you can click the link in the description and download the game on your preferred devices. It doesn't take a lot of storage, and I personally play it in my free time. I also want to point out that the combat mechanics are easy to understand, and the UI design isn't that confusing to use. I also love how the game helps in leveling up characters and navigating through the different materials required for each one, giving an easier way for us players. Now, if you have some thoughts or more things to add, you may do so in the comments. I'm planning to make more videos about the story of Reverse 1999 and summarize more of the different factions and characters in the game, so subscribe to be notified when they will be released. As always, thank you very much for watching, my name is Clementine, till the next one, be safe and stay tuned.